Hello Buddhist Geeks, I'm Emily Horn and this is part two of the Enlightenment Engineers episode um, of the Geeks of the Round Table. And today I am joined with Vincent Horn. Hello. Um, <laughs> Kelly Sosan Bearer. Hi. And Kenneth Folk. Hi. Hmm. So today we wanted to just pick up where we left off last time and really dive into what is enlightenment. Um, the article um, from the Wired magazine was entitled Enlightenment Engineers. So what is that? Um, so we wanted to explore that today and we have a few themes that we wanted to touch on. Um, besides what is enlightenment, we also wanted to just kind of touch on maps of enlightenment and goal orientation and wisdom. So the first thing I wanted to do um, was read a little bit of um, a quote from the article. And um, framing it is, you know, I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, the dinner. Kenneth and um, Vincent and I were at a dinner with the, with, um, with the person who wrote this article, Noah Shankman, and a couple other people. And it was a very center point of this article. Um, and a lot of different things came out about it. Um, one of the quotes from the dinner, um, it says, quote, enlightenment implies sainthood perfect wisdom, and an end to the cycle of birth and death. Folk, Michelson, Horn are polishing off a second bottle of red. Is that who they think they are? <laughs> so I wanted to just kind of jump into that. Is that who we think we are? And um, see what comes about. So I wanted <laughs> to see if people have thoughts about that, um, and then we can just go from there. Hmm. Well, maybe we should say a little more about the dinner and kind of just set the context a little bit sure. so people yeah. kind of understand what was mm -hmm. happening there and why we yeah. were polishing off two bottles of red. And, yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> I mean, so so from what I remember, uh, you know, there was just a small group of us, Jay Michelson, Noah Shackman, uh, Kenneth, your wife Beth was there, uh, yourself, Emily, I, and we were just hanging out. You invited us to kind of come hang out with Noah while we were in San Francisco for the Wisdom 2.0 conference. and. Um, just sort of talk to him uh, about about some of the themes he's was planning on writing about with this article, and um, it seemed like he wanted to kind of explore the, the the theme of enlightenment since that's largely what you're exploring, Kenneth. And so he was just asking a kind of variety of questions about enlightenment, and um, uh, it was we were sort of responding in a frank and honest way, and. Some of that got, I think, translated into the article, and some of that <laughs> sort of got lost and twisted as things do, you know, in 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 things like this. Um, but I don't know exactly what he meant by uh, by who this, is this who they think they are. I, I I didn't quite get get what he was saying there, so I I honestly can't respond to that quote. But um, yeah, what did what did you guys? What was your in, uh, impression of that? Well, I think we can't uh, rule out the possibility that, that like all good uh, reporters and, uh, and writers, he wants to write something interesting, so he's deliberately making this provocative. So beginning with the assumption that enlightenment implies uh, perfect sainthood, uh, then why are these guys talking about enlightenment while, while they're okay. polishing off their second bottle of red? I mean, it's it's a very good question, and then so we have to explain what do we mean by enlightenment? Do do I think enlightenment uh, means perfect sainthood? Well, no, I I don't think that at all, and I actually don't think that's what the early Buddhists meant by it either. So if you accept that there really were a bunch of people 2,500 years ago clustered around the Buddha, and uh, and all getting enlightened or all awakening with the Buddha as the first of his group to get in, awakened, uh, what was really happening for them? Were yes. they becoming glow-in-the-dark, beatifically smiling 24-7 cartoon saints who never had a, a, a negative thought? And by the way, how would you even, even define that? Uh, everybody has different standards of what negativity is. Um, but in any case, I dismiss that whole idea. No, they weren't saints. I don't think there ever have been saints, my humble opinion. I think what was happening is that they were training the mind in such a way 
that they could see experience as process. This is my favorite way to talk about it currently. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, that's a whole discussion, and, and we can go into some of that. But, but no, I don't think I'm a saint, and I don't think any of you are saints. I don't think the Buddha was a saint, by my definition. That's, that's interesting. And it's funny, too, because isn't one of the translations that was given for the term arhat, which is the fully enlightened you know, uh, person, wasn't it, isn't it saint? Isn't that one of the translations that, that the early translators kind of gave to that? Yes, and, and so some of the translations are world conqueror. World conqueror. Yeah. Right. And, and saint, right. But that saint uh, is an English word, and it, it means uh, it comes, as far as I can tell, out of Christianity. And what do we think of? We think of a person with a halo who, uh, who behaves impeccably at all times. Uh, is that a g even a good translation of the word arahat? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I th yeah. sorry. Yeah, to me, this really um, starts to illuminate the um, the ideals that we all have about enlightenment. And um, Vince, you were talking about earlier um, today about the um, what you know, enlightened people versus enlightened activity. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, th I think that's that was one thing that I thought of while reading this article was the there's a, a famous quote from Suzuki Roshi, you know, this early Japanese Zen teacher who um, came to San Francisco and taught for many years, and he uh, he has a he was quoted to have said, uh, strictly speaking, there's there's no enlightened people, there's just enlightened activity, and um, I, I think that's a beautiful. First of all, I think it's a beautiful statement, you know, to to kind of undermine the notion that enlightenment or awakening or this seeing reality as process, as Kenneth put it, is something that we can kind of take ownership of interiorly, that we can kind of hold on to it and identify with it, because in some sense that is the very thing that we're waking up from, is that tendency to kind of grasp onto or hold on to certain ideas or notions of who we are. And so saying that there's only enlightened activity is kind of a way to cut through that tendency to kind of uh, build an enlightened ego, an enlightened identity you know, around, oh, I have achieved this experience or this state or whatever. And I mean, for anyone who's been around spiritual communities knows people who walk around you know, um, with big kind of huge enlightened <laughs> egos. And I think, I don't know, to me, I don't know what you guys think, but I, I sort of think this is a natural part of a process to to, to, to kind of blow up at certain times. And um, I think in Zen, I, I've heard the term the stink of enlightenment. Kelly, have yeah. you heard that term? Uh, the stink of Zen, yeah. Stink of Zen. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of enlightened, stinky ego. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do think it's developmental. It's almost like the adolescent phase of, because uh, I like to think of enlightenment or awakening as on a spectrum, kind of the spectrum of consciousness. You have the spectrum of awakening and enlightenment, kind of like the sliding scale. So the degree to which you are enlightened is really mm. um, what I look at, like just as a as a scale versus like an end goal. Mm. Um, so with that said, as like the stink of Zen, I, I just feel like it's a very, if you were to put like developmental stages in terms of the spiritual process, it feels very uh, like adolescent <laughs> in a sense. Yeah, and and you know I think one of the one of the ways that I've seen that this. Uh, this thing from Suzuki's interpreted is, well, we shouldn't really talk about enlightenment then, because if we're talking about it, then that somehow implies that we're in that adolescent phase. You know, to, to say that, that I've experienced some degree of awakening in some way, some fashion, sort of implies just by talking about it that I'm somehow identified with it and I'm, I've got this sort of stink, this enlightenment stink. And what I've found is that, like, it's a little conf it's actually really confusing because if we can't talk about it then how do we know what we're doing and how can we uh, actually check to see if we're making some some actual progress in our practice and how can we you know uh, have like just down to earth conversations and say well hey what have you experienced and you know how do you make sense of that and so for me the the whole thing of there's only enlightened activity strictly speaking um, when he says strictly speaking that's the thing that I question like strictly speaking from what perspective? 
strictly speaking from the Zen perspective of what enlightenment is, like that's probably true. But if you're saying strictly speaking from, say, like a more um, objective, you know, perspective where you can sort of just look through time and see how things change and kind of step back for a moment, you know, and even take a kind of more scientific or objective perspective or rational perspective on things, I think it's totally valid because we have that capacity as human beings to, to look back and see patterns through time and that that doesn't necessarily have to conflict with this inner experience of there not being any sort of uh, holding on to an idea of what enlightenment is. Um, so that's the part that I, I feel like is uh, confused sometimes, the difference between that sort of first-person experience of, of awakening and the third-person description of it. And I don't see any reason that those two can't actually coexist and that we can't switch between them without confusing or conflating them. Um, and I don't think it's when someone says, I've experienced some sort of awakening, that that means that they're necessarily identified with it or stuck on it. Um, I don't know what you guys have experienced, but I, but I think that's a big confusion, and it, it, create, it creates a circumstance that, that, Kenneth, you often talk about, where it, it creates a, what you call a mushroom culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so basically what happens is identification runs rampant. So, I, uh, so identification happens again. We identify as the one, uh, he who knows does not speak, he who speaks does not know. Well, I'm the one who knows, so I'm not going to speak. So then now you're really in a bind here. And, and it also, uh, it also um, flies in the face of reality testing. Uh, if, you, if, you say, if you were to say, he who knows does not speak, well, from what we know of the Buddha, uh, he was talking about it the whole time. So for 50 years, that's all he wanted to talk about was, was how awake he was and how you could be awake too. Uh, so... At the same time, Suzuki Roshi's quote, um, I like the fact that he said, strictly speaking, because he's telling us that he's looking through a particular lens. Uh, and the particular lens that, that I would uh, claim, he's, or I would imagine he was, he was looking through, is kind of an old-school Buddhist lens, or a, a, a Buddhism 101 lens. There isn't anybody in here to get enlightened, or at least we can't find anybody in here to get enlightened. So, strictly speaking, who's getting enlightened um, we don't know, and so there are no enlightened individuals. <clears throat> there are no enlightened individuals because there are no enlight. There are no individuals. Mm -hmm. So obviously, there's no enlightened ones, and there are no unenlightened ones. Fine. So that's a lens, as you say. And Vince, I like the way you you um, point out that this makes a lot more sense once we can talk about lenses. From that lens, only enlightened activity. What about from a practical lens, a pragmatic lens, where you'd like to help people improve their lives through this particular kind of development that we're calling awakening or enlightenment? Um, how best to do that? Would I be best? Would I uh, be most effective in that endeavor if I never said anything? Come on, no. Uh, uh, to the extent that that any of us feel that we understand this process even a little bit. We can talk about it. We can disclose uh, fully. Uh, we can we can uh, abolish the mushroom culture. So the, the mushroom, of course, refers to uh, keep them in the dark and, and feed them shit. It's something that <laughs> my teacher Bill Hamilton said to me when I came when I returned from my first three month retreat at IMS, and I and he told me uh, I gave him my report, and he said, "Oh well, this is when you were in." The, arising and passing away phase, and that's when you were in dissolution, that's when you were in the Duke and Yanas, and so forth. Uh, and I said, why didn't my interview teachers tell me this in real time? Because it would have been really helpful, uh, and, and I probably wouldn't have uh, languished so long in the Duke and Yanas, this particular phase, uh, if I'd known that just around the corner is equanimity and maybe even stream entry, if I could kind of stay the course. Instead, I stopped practicing and wandered around crying all the time. So uh, it, it would have been great if they had told me, and, and Bill said they treated you like a mushroom. Uh, so that's where the mushroom culture idea comes from. And I railed against this for years. I think this is changing a lot. I think we, uh, as, as Buddhist geeks and pragmatic Dharma people, are, are changing it 
And I think that's a really good thing. So part of changing the mushroom culture is not to identify with this uh, idealized notion, not to go around trying to act enlightened by not saying anything, just, just kind of let go of all that and say, this is my experience, uh, let's talk about it, and let's see if we can develop, if, let's see if I can develop further, and let's see if I can help you develop further. That seems really practical to me. That's a lens, too. Mm. And Kelly, I'd be curious since you spent quite a bit of time like in Zen cultures where you know it's common to not talk openly about enlightenment. What was your experience of that? What were the kind of uh, I'd be curious what the upsides and downsides of that kind of culture were from your perspective? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll start with the downsides. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not talking about it, obviously, um, I think keeps people in a state of confusion, whether that's like a really intense state of confusion or very, very subtle, of just kind of not knowing what's going on. So when you're confused and you don't know what's going on, you, you naturally look outside of yourself for like an authority or a guide or someone to point the way. So I think in Zen, it's almost set up that way so that you are kind of relying on the teacher for that stuff um, in a certain way. Otherwise, why would you be there? Why would you need a guide? Why would you need... Um, and this is just an assumption I'm making. <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but it felt like it was kind of like super old school imperial Zen training brought into the West and never updated and then just used as a method, whether conscious or unconscious. So um, I think keeping people, like keep the mushroom, I never really thought about it like that, but keeping people in the dark um, naturally creates some kind of uh, glue or stickiness between you and teacher, I think, that you feel like you need you need some kind of outside authority guy or pointing out of the way. Um, that's a great point. Um, that's a little bit more in the negative. Um, other, other more positive reasons to kind of keep people confused or not talking about enlightenment or maps of enlightenment um, is I think really in a simple way just to get people to kind of drop all that drop goal, drop orientation, drop striving, drop, drop, drop. Um, so I do think there is benefit to keeping people in a more confused state as well. Um, <laughs> uh, there's also um, there's also something about Sangha where you have um, more advanced students and younger students and there's a sometimes it's like insidious culture of the more advanced students um, wanting to kind of teach the younger the younger practitioners um, the way or how to get somewhere or to even kind of postmark where they are in terms of their development and so a way to kind of not have that happen is to just not really have those conversations involved at all but but in my Zen experience like people are always talking about it wasn't so much the word enlightenment it was more about waking up and awakening and so the, the big E word wasn't really used a lot um, there's other terms used for it um, more like waking up and awakening mm -hmm. um, versus enlightenment, but those are some of the benefits and disadvantages to not talking about it, I think, that I've seen. Yeah, you know, uh, Ke Kenneth, I, I don't know if you would agree with this, but one of the things I found most challenging about some of the um, pragmatic Dharma cultures, uh, especially the ones that were uh, happening in terms of um, the Dharma overground and pragmatic Dharma sites, you know, there's something about those where, um, you know, the, because everyone was trying to get enlightened, like, I think the implicit thing was actually uh, this is a big deal and uh, if you have it, it's really good and if you don't, like, it, 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 there, there was this kind of interesting new kind of problems that emerged when we did sort of open up the discussion and I, I noticed, like, I fe feeling a lot of immaturity around it for myself, like, trying to be the big dog, you know, all this sort of like power authority <laughs> stuff. And then I notice a lot of other people playing playing that stuff out in weird and, and kind of bizarre ways. And I found like there were problems with just a culture of openness as well. And I don't know how much of that is related to it just not being open for a long time and how much of that is related to, um, you know, kind of other things. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what you think about that. Yeah, well, that, that certainly did happen. It was like a bunch of uh, adolescent chest thumpers uh, competing for who could be the most enlightened person around and who could, uh, who could convince everybody else. And there was status. You could get status in this community, this online community, by 
appearing to be more enlightened than everybody else. And it's, it's, um, it, it is childish on the face of it. And, and I think it's built in. I think it's, uh, if you're going to have uh, disclosure in about any kind of a developmental process, you're going to have this natural human primate behavior where we want to get status by being more developed than the next person. So for me, that just all, all of that can be rolled back in to the, to the disclosure uh, um, ethic or ethos. You can say, uh, let's look at that too. Look at how we're all chest thumping and, and trying to establish ourselves as the top dog and, and basically failing because as soon as you try to do that, everybody else points out your folly, you point out your weaknesses. Now on the upside, because the disclosure continues and the discussion continues, everybody learns. So whatever kind of leveling up we've got going on uh, continues and you just cycle the, the chest thumping right back into it. So you can see where my bias is. My bias is to, uh, is to go with openness and disclosure even though there are downsides to it. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of, um, you know, we're talking about this and I can't help but think that this is a very masculine approach in some ways. I mean, the chest thumping, the getting ahead and, um, you know, when I incorporate uh, the feminine perspective in as well, it's like it's very circular too. So we have to keep in mind the linear progression and the circular aspect. I know when I, um, you know, talk to my teacher, Jack um, Cornfield about the maps and the progress of insight. Um, you know, he's saying he's seen many people, you know, progress through it and then fall back into the dark night process or fall backwards. So it's like we progress forwards and then we can circle back and progress forwards and circle back. And to me, it, it turns into like the spiraling kind of um, of of movement where yes, there is a linear progression and we have to keep in mind that um, there is an embracing and a circular quality to it. Um, that is is really important because it takes for me that takes part that takes away a little bit of the I get to the top of the mountain and then I'm done so we can hold both of the the um, the goal orientation with um, a, a more broad deepening of mindful awareness. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a more accurate and, and a more mature understanding because if we really believed it was a linear thing mm -hmm. and that there is some top of the mountain with that you get to, uh, we're setting ourselves up uh, to fail. Uh, if you say, I'm going to get to a place where I'm completely enlightened in that, what that means is uh, there's a particular outcome. I have a steady state experience mm -hmm. of X. And it's, it's usually, a, it's a cosmic bliss out. That's what everybody wants, right? Of course, I want that. But I've come to the point where of understanding that that's not how it works, but we want that. It's hardwired into us. So uh, even a little bit of critical thinking uh, about this reveals that as silly. For one thing, it's contradictory to Buddhist Buddhism 101, that there would be a steady state. Hmm, how does that work? Uh, impermanence is, is, is said to be one of the, the universal characteristics. So there isn't going to be a steady state. Well, okay, then there isn't going to be a steady state, but I'm still going to have uh, I'm nothing but a cosmic bliss out? No, because that's a steady state. So if we, if we incorporate this idea of, of circularity or, or a spiral, whether you're spiraling up or down, however you like to, to think of this, uh, what we get to is the only reasonable thing for us to do is to embrace process. Now that's really exciting because once you do that, now you have a you have a, a project that will go on that, that can last a lifetime. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, sometimes it will be unpleasant. Sometimes it will be pleasant, and sometimes it will be neutral. Buddhist theory, and I can always look at that. Uh, I can always uh, ask myself, what am I missing, uh, and learn more. So, so when process becomes the task, now you're never going to be out of a job, which I find appealing. Yeah, it brings the more of the evolutionary spirituality component into that, that we can continue to, to, um, to develop as humans. Just like, you know, the Theravadan maps run out at a certain point and it, 
seems to me that non-dual awareness and understanding came apart in more of the Mahayana and the Zen. So um, to me, I think it's really interesting. To me, this is where Buddhism as a whole starts to reveal itself rather than the different aspects of the traditions. Um, it just pauses a question to me there. Yeah, well, I, I like the, the fact that you bring up the, uh, the non-dual thing because that's something else we identify with. We, mm -hmm. we think, I'm a, I'm a person who understands non-duality, and that's the highest doctrine. Mm -hmm. and, and so anything that isn't non-dual is substandard. Uh, but you fall into the same trap. Mm -hmm. uh, there, for one thing, there's an outcome, and I know what it is. That's, that's questionable in the first place that anybody would mm -hmm. say that. Uh, and for another thing, we're going to posit this, this continuous state of non-duality Mm. Uh, as being the best thing that can happen, and we get into all kinds of contradictions. Oh, well, but, but what about the fact that uh, I have all these dualistic thoughts? Mm -hmm. Does that mean I'm bad? I'm doing it wrong? Was there ever a person who only had a, a, a unit of experience all the time? Interesting. Um, there might be people like that. Uh, they're probably brain damaged, and you probably don't want that. If you think about it, if you think about your most unitive experience when you were on mushrooms or acid or maybe in a in a meditation experience, uh, it, it, we fixate upon those experiences in hindsight or even at the time, and we say, "This is what I want. I want this all the time." I don't think it is. For one thing, you'd be crazy. You'd be dysfunctional. You'd be saying, uh, "I just saw a video the other day of a woman in the fifties." who was part of an LSD experiment. She drinks this LSD 25 in water, and an hour and a half later she's saying, if, if, if you could just see what I see, I, I hear, I, I, I see the, I, I hear the visuals, and she's you know, having all this synesthesia. She's nuts, she's just temporarily nuts. Now granted, she's having a wonderful time, but if you're walking around like that all the time, you got a problem. So I don't think, uh, we're seeing this clearly. We really don't want to have a unit of experience all the time. You, you know that that reminds me. I was um, I was hanging out with David Loy, who's a, a Zen teacher, and um, non-duality, of course, is like a big Zen term. And I, I had been feeling for quite a while that there were actually different kinds of non-dualities and different kinds of awakenings that mm -hmm. these some different people and different traditions were describing and I, I, I was kind of curious what he thought so I said do you think there are different kinds of non-dualities and he said well um, there are as many kinds of non-dualities as there are dualities mm -hmm. so which is to say you know if, if a duality or a dichotomy or a kind of a binary is like this and that you know and a non-duality is some sort of you know kind of seeing through that um, those extremes or those kind of dichotomies you know then there could be all kinds of dichotomies there could be you know, the dichotomy or the duality between self and world there could be the duality between form and emptiness there could be you know all sorts of dualities that we talk about on the contemplative path and is it the case that maybe you know as we talk about enlightenment I think we're we're sort of talking about it in one way you know we're, we're sort of using uh, a particular model um, but but are there other you know ways of looking at enlightenment? Are there other lenses? Um, are there other kinds of non-dualities? And what does that imply about the contemplative path and about kind of, quote unquote awakening or enlightenment? And I think that's very interesting. And I think to be able to even have that conversation and to disagree about it, we have to be able to talk about it. And so that's one of the things I've noticed that happen that's happening as we start creating cultures of more openness around these things is that actually a lot of what I've seen happen is disagreement and people um, not having the same kinds of experiences and trying to in many cases um, sort of put each other in each other's models mm -hmm. uh, or question each other's models or or show how your model is limited because it's not my model and to me that sort of implies that there are actually different kinds of enlightenment or different kinds of experiences that are happening um, I don't uh, it, it feels like it's a little bit hard to verify because all we're dealing with in some sense is kind of report, like subjective reporting. Um, but I'd be really curious, you know, as this, this whole conversation moves forward, are, are we going to see different, you know, for instance, neurocorrelates to different descriptions of enlightenment? Are we going to see, you know, that there actually might be these kind of like, uh, that, that enlightenment might be a multidimensional thing 
um, where to a certain degree certain traditions explore certain pathways you know and go real deep in them I'd be curious what you guys think about that because because to me that's that's one of the most exciting things to discuss is the possibility of, of enlightenment being bigger than I sort of imagined <laughs> Yeah, I have something to say about that, but I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to uh, hog all of uh, all of the time in my masculine chest thumping way. So, Emily, you look, you look like you were going to say something. You're, you're so enlightened, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just. I mean, that just. I I just had a flashback to a, a particular moment when I was practicing um, pretty intensely on a retreat, and at one point because I had all the maps in my head because I've definitely had learned to break down my experience and track my experience in the in the um, circular and linear way of the insight maps and at one point it was just like I hit this wall and I just remember going I can't depend on these maps like I have to let go of the models in order to actually see clearly um, who is it that's seeing clearly like I don't know but I have to let go of all this um, so at a certain point I wonder if that is part of of the awakening process is that we have to kind of stand in that no man's land and say, okay, like, um, you know, this has been traveled for 2,500 or something years in this particular Buddhist tradition, and at the same time, um, if we take into account evolutionary development and human development and all these different lines of development, that um, it puts me in a I don't know um, space um, as well, and then. Um, Kenneth, I'm happy to hear what you have to say, too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always like the physical fitness parallels, and I, I think it reveals so much. Uh, how many different ways are there to be an athlete? As many, as many ways as there are athletes. That you, can, you can look at some similarities uh, depending on how people train, and there's some kind of a selection, self-selection process where people who have a body type that will work for marathoning are more likely to become marathoners than people who have another kind of a body type. And so there's some, um, some selection there. Uh, but depending on training and, and um, interest and potential, uh, we can identify some currents but we never see two athlete, athletes that look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So, isn't that preferencing to... the personal though? I'm just curious because my mind goes like because it gets all confused at this point because it seems like we bought, we like toggle back and forth between like the personal, which is never two in the same, and then there's the universal, which seems to be that there could be a universal kind of aspect to it, like an athlete. I don't know. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, because if we, I, I hear you, because if we're uh, going to posit some reality with a capital R, yeah. uh, which doesn't make sense to me, but I mean, we, we, we hear a lot of talk about this kind of thing, and then, and then, it, then there's some universal truth with a capital T, mm -hmm. and then we can, we can at least imagine that there is some completely unfiltered way to experience that as a human being. Now, if all of those things are true, then two human beings or any number of human beings could have exactly the same experience. Most of those assumptions I don't buy in the first place. Uh, especially this thing about uh, the completely unfiltered perception that somehow the experience that you're having as a human being isn't filtered by your unique brain chemistry and structure and, and your uh, conditioning. I don't think that's possible. So the so I think everything uh, everything we see is filtered through some kind of a lens. The uh, a non-dual experience is a non-dual lens. In fact, uh, I don't privilege non-dual experience over dualistic experience. It's mm -hmm. all experience, as far as I can tell. But, but that, <laughs> this, uh, this idea that there is one place where this is going, I think this is a really important thing to expose and at least talk about. So uh, most of us will say, I have a pretty good idea of what enlightenment is or what awakening is, and, it, and then they'll point to their favorite, uh, their inspirational figure. Oh, well, I know what it is because it's Ramana Maharshi. 
and, and or I know what it is because it's Suzuki Roshi. Just name your saint. It's Ama, the hugging saint, whatever. Uh, and anybody who isn't that is a failed version of that. Now I think this is really faulty uh, reasoning. Uh, for one thing, if you look at any other uh, any other process or uh, any other kind of human development, it never converges on one point. It never happens that all athletes look the same way. It never happens at all. Scholars look the same way. You have all these different ways to be. And I also like to make this parallel with evolution. You could, you could make a really silly argument that you, everybody would instantly see through. You could say, I know where evolution is going. There was a point to it the whole time. Mm -hmm. well, the, the point was to get to, and then you just pick something, the grasshopper. Look at the grasshopper. Look how beautiful it is. Look how perfectly adapted it is to its environment. Evolution was always headed there. Now, anything that is not a grasshopper is simply a failed version of a grasshopper. If it evolved enough, it would get to a grasshopper. And you go, that's preposterous. It's, it is preposterous, and so is the idea of, of a particular outcome to this developmental process that we're talking about as awakening. Okay, that's, that's interesting because that saying that kind of flies in the face of the whole perennial philosophy, you know, which is that there is this sort of uh, fundamental um, something which is shared by all the contemplative traditions. All the wisdom traditions are pointing to the same thing. And um, to, to me, that's the thing I've been wrestling with in a certain way is, is kind of, uh, and Emily and I have a lot of conversations about this, because um, we end up sort of being on on two sides of this conversation usually, and she says, "No, you're 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 missing the universal, or you're missing some aspect of the universal." And I'm like, "No, there is no universal," <laughs> um, and which which itself can become a kind of universal. So so that's where I that also find this whole conversation gets weird, because it seems like no matter what we're claiming as the kind of truth claim, even if we say there is no kind of fundamental universal that's kind of shared among all these things. I mean, that is a strong, that is a strong claim and it's a strong, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, we have to back it up with a, a particular model and a particular experience and, mm -hmm. and I think every model, you know, from what I've seen, it, it has, they have strengths and they have weak weaknesses, you know, they have areas that, that, not to say some models aren't better than other models, but um, I'm just curious about, this gets kind of hyper philosophical, but um, it's really, quite challenging because it impacts the way the ways I think that we choose to practice um, because then the question is if there if there isn't one enlightenment you know one kind of one point at the top of the hill you know that every path will lead to then the question is well where where is this leading and do I want to be going there um, and how do I find the right path for where I'm trying to head? And how do I even know that where I'm trying to head is where I really <laughs> need to be heading? Um, like all those questions come up and it, and it, it sort of takes, it, it introduces a lot of choice into what's already a confusing um, process, I think, and, and makes it even more challenging. Well, it makes me think of, sorry, go ahead, Emily. No, go ahead. It makes me think of what I, uh, of what I call provisional flag planting. So flag planting, generally speaking, is going to be a problem. If I say this is how it is, and, and I'll argue this until death, this is how it is, um, I'll be wrong every time. But, it, but if I say, well, I'm going to take this point of view. This is my lens that I'm working on. I'm fleshing it out, and I'm going to present the case for it, um, understanding that something is going to emerge. So it, it always comes back to this idea of process. If we stop thinking so much about an outcome that we can predict in advance, and more about well, there is this this practice these practices we can do, and the practices that are most interesting to me uh, are and, and now I'm I'm actually talking about myself. I'm interested in in process practice. Just keep cycling it back in. Just keep asking this question: What is the filter? What's flying under the radar? What am I missing? Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where it's going. I can see a lot of things have been debunked through this process. And one of the things that currently feels thoroughly debunked to me is, is the grasshopper, is that there is some particular place this goes. But that could change too. So once you embrace this, this uh, uh, passion for emergence, uh, 
that's very robust. That's a, I, I think that's just a really good way to practice. That doesn't mean you can't identify particular metrics that you want to train in. You, in other words, if you say, I want to be able to enter an altered state called a jhana and, um, and just sit in it and completely immersed in this state of bliss for two hours with very little or no thinking. Well, that is one of the metrics that some meditation masters use for states of concentration. That's clear. That it, it, it's, for me, it, it's like it would be like um, getting good at golf or more specifically getting good at putting. Great. Getting good at putting is a really valuable thing. But let's put it all in perspective. Is getting good at putting, is getting good at entering an altered state, is that the same as uh, um, experiencing ex your life as process? No. And then, well, which do I prefer? You can, you can, you can make some sort of provisional flag planting about which do I want to emphasize at this point in my practice. Yeah, it's kind of like short game versus long game here. Mm -hmm. okay, this is this is fascinating. Yeah. I wanted to bring up too that um, in relationship to this, I had I was thinking that I, I understand the process and then I also want to bring in the goal orientation too because this article focuses a lot on the goal orientation of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, and Jack Cornfield was quoted in the article and he, you know, asked about like, you know, do you teach this um, progress of insight? Um, and he, he said if someone really wants it, he would, um, quote, but a strong goal orientation can heighten unhealthy ambition and self-criticism. It doesn't really heighten wisdom. So um, to me, that's one of the main questions in this is, you know, if we focus on the progress of insight or the process orientation, um, it does it change our lives. Um, I know for me, it, I, it did. It changed my perspective. Um, I can look back and there have been shifts along the way that I can identify and say, okay, yeah, that happened and that shifted my perspective. It shifted my identity. Um, and it also... So I, and I guess I, I see some trends and um, just wonder what you all think about that, about it um, heightening unhealthy ambition to look at it in the strong goal orientation. Uh, I, I think everything is a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, you can heighten unhealthy ambition. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? I mean, I, becoming a great athlete could heighten unhealthy ambition. Does that mean nobody should become a great athlete? No, not at all. Uh, and in fact, I think Noah Schachtman, the, the author of that article in Wired, uh, presented something that was just wrong. You know, he presented an assumption that, well, the, uh, folks, goal, goal orientation flies in the face of, of the traditional Buddhist understanding that, uh, of goallessness. I can't remember how he, how he phrased that. But that's just wrong because because if you go back to the earliest teachings that we know about, uh, the uh, in the Theravada, the Pali texts, uh, supposedly the dying words of the Buddha were apamadena sampadeta, strive diligently. That's goal oriented, and the, and the Buddha's teaching was goal oriented. Do these practices and wake up, uh, because the way you're experiencing your life now isn't as good, frankly, as as being awake, uh, totally goal oriented. So I, I want to expose that assumption that I think a lot of people in the West have that the right way to understand this is nowhere to go, nothing to get. Well, that's just one lens, one valuable lens. And if we can triangulate from many different lenses, this, this certainly this, uh, yeah, this is how it is, take it or leave it. There's a lot of wisdom in that. And, wow, if you train, you can improve. A lot of wisdom in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see it in Zen too with the, uh, the adage of, um, you know, have few desires but have great ones. So there is that sense of striving, that sense of goal, but very, be very conscious of what it is you want and, and go big. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and, when, and when, when I hear that quote, you know, about unhealthy ambition, it can... It can uh, sort of strengthen unhealthy ambition. I think unhealthy ambition implies that there is a healthy ambition, you know, that there is a way to have ambition um, that that isn't um, sort of self-destructive. Um, and I, I don't know. I've I've noticed being 
being a fairly ambitious person generally that um, you know uh, there are times where I felt like there's been ambition driving me that I wasn't aware of that was that ended up leading to some pretty crappy results you know in retrospect and then there have been other times where it, mixed in with that you know there have been some amazing results so I'm, I'm not sure really how one can separate those two out um, uh, it seems like again looking at process uh, you know seeing our ambition and seeing kind of where it's arising from or how it's arising is also a really amazing practice and a, a great way to investigate um, experience and you know I the other piece around this uh, I just want to throw out there is I th I suspect part of the reason the uh, goallessness model of enlightenment is so popular is because of the predominant culture we have which is already really ambitious and very goal driven you know in almost every area of life the amount of challenge that's uh, sort of asked of people whether it's education or in their family lives or in really any in, in work like the, the 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 challenge to kind of step up and to 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 to, to grow and to be, to develop is really high you know in our culture and I think a lot of people just they feel burnt out in a certain way from that and then they see this sort of goalless thing and they're like oh yeah you know goallessness that that's something I've really been missing and I haven't been seeing so goallessness that's, that's my goal yeah <laughs> Right, right, right. Oh. So, I mean, just to acknowledge the cultural dimensions of this, you know, it's like uh, the boomers um, who brought, primarily brought Buddhism to America, to the West, they, they were in some sense culturally reacting to this sort of hyper, kind of hyper goal-oriented uh, culture that didn't, you know, uh, appreciate at all the, in some ways, the goallessness or the just kind of beingness uh, perspective and so in that sense it feels almost like a, a kind of corrective perspective you know culturally and I, I wonder if that's part of the reason it's also so popular but the problem with that is then spirituality is separate from everything else again it creates this new um, split you know where spirituality is this thing over here goallessness and everything else is kind of like you know samsara it's the it's the kind of world of suffering and and you know striving and uh, you know people you know just stepping on top of each other and uh, like that that seems like it creates a new kind of problem that that then we have to deal with and address so uh, anyway I, I don't know how we're gonna get out of this <laughs> well, but, but the, the this is why I'm so in love with the idea of process because it, it, it's iterative so there's always a new thing to put in the hopper oh I just identified a, a, a problem with my approach well right what did you think was gonna happen well then put it in the hopper notice that uh, see that that's that that's the current lens it, it just it, it doesn't end the beautiful things thing about things that don't end is that they don't end and so you <laughs> it's, you're, never, you're never out of a job never never out of a gig uh, in terms of your own practice I mean to to have this endlessly engaging uh, um, activity of putting it in the hopper well, thank you very much, everyone. This has been a very fruitful front conversation. And um, we've had part one, and now this is part two of the Enlightenment Engineer series. And so we have, um, have planned a part three episode where we will take questions and do a question and answer um, section for this. So we will be scheduling that in the next few weeks. So look um, forward to that, and we will look forward to that. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Bye. take care.